Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day, subscribe and click the bell. Nancy never knew her mother, but in her heart she loved the woman who had given her life. Every day she looked at her daughter with kind, affectionate eyes with a picture on the wall. Touching by this photo, mom was very beautiful, leading dark hair to the shoulders, large framed with long eyelashes, eyes, a soft kind smile. When Nancy was little, she had lived up on her father's lap and asked him to tell her about her mom, who had flown away on a cloud. The man would sigh sadly and say our mom was the most wonderful. It was an axiom that Nancy grew up with in kindergarten and on the street. She told all the kids what her mom was like. The kids reacted differently. And if she's so good, why is she on the cover? Why doesn't she fly to you and bring you candy? The neighbor's gym tried to hurt the girl's feelings. She does. Nancy answered with her red booted foot out in front of her and her hand at her side. Mommy brings me candy for my birthday and Christmas and puts it next to my bed or under the tree. It's not mommy, it's your daddy, Jim said, and you're a writer. You don't have a mom on the cover. Yes, I do. Yes, I do, screamed the girl. She was about to cry. Suddenly Nick got between them and Jim. Nancy's not lying, he told Jim. Nick was two years older than the other kids. They obeyed him unconditionally, submitting to Nick's authority. After all, he was already in first grade. Not hers. Dad himself told how she was a wall. Mom was in the sky. But it's too early for you to know that. Come on, Nancy. The boy took her by the hand and led her away. From that day on no one dared even argue with the girl, let alone venture to call her names or tease her. At the slightest attempt to offend Nancy in front of the offenders, as a guardian angel appeared Nick, do not be afraid of anything. I will always protect you now, he said to the girl. And whoever dares molest you will have to deal with my fists. He ostentatiously clenched his palms into a fist and shoved it to Nancy. She realized that Nick wasn't kidding. Even though Nancy didn't know her mom, she always felt that she was somewhere close by and knew that her mom was the best and kindest thing in the world. Her father loved the girl's mother very much. He took her in marriage, a very young girl. Almost immediately the girl became pregnant. The young family began to wait for the firstborn, but in childbirth the girl's heart failed and she died, giving her beloved husband little Nancy all his love for his wife. Chuck took it out on his daughter. Another man would have drunk himself to death or he'd have gone after his wife, but Chuck's still with the little girl and never leaves her side. Neighbors were talking, watching a man with a stroller going to the village store for groceries or hanging laundry in the yard. There is no telling how he would have coped if it hadn't been for the girl's grandmother. Chuck's mother came as soon as she could from a neighboring village to lift the little girl. She felt sorry for her son with all her heart because he was already a young widower and even with a load in the form of an infant. When the girl was a year old, her mother said that you should get married, son. You don't need a mother on the wall. I understand. The mother answered man. Sit down on the bench in the yard next to the stroller, in which the daughter was peacefully. Only here I cannot even imagine that another woman will bring up Nancy and suddenly will offend. What if she can't love her as her own? I don't know, but no matter how it's done, a child can't do without a woman's affection. And who will teach her how to manage the household to teach her the wisdom of women? Chuck thought for a while, and then hugged, sitting down next to her neck. You will help, won't you? He asked. I'd love to. But he will not live long. And how will I die? Live to be 100 years old, mother. What's your idea? No matter how much you think about it or not, every man has his own destiny and his own time. When Nancy was five years old, her father took her to the neighboring village to visit her grandparents. Everything was a wonder to the girl. The big village was not at all like their village kindergarten with beautiful and brightly colored multicolored paint. A two-story brick school and a white stone temple with gilded domes passed the windows. That's the school you'll go to when you're a little older, my father said. They'll teach you to read and write there. You'll learn a lot of interesting things. I already know the letters. My grandmother bought me an alphabet book, and Nick teaches me to read by syllables. But I can't do it. And you're Nick. Look, he's a good kid, my father said. The man liked the boy. He never left his daughter's side. 
Chuck was happy to let Nancy run around outside, if Nick came over. I watch her with a serious look, the boy said, though he was only seven years old and had just started first grade. Grandmother and grandfather couldn't be happy with the dear guests, gave them a treat on the straw, didn't let their granddaughter off their knees. And the next day grandmother dressed Nancy in a beautiful new dress, tied a scarf on her head and took her to the temple. Grandma, where are we going? Asked on the way to church the girl asked the Begyushka, come on, he will not wave to you and put a silver cross around your neck. The old lady answered, and why didn't Nancy understand? So that heavenly father will never leave you. Heavenly father, does he live with mommy on a cloud? Yes, the sweet old lady paused for a moment and looked at her granddaughter carefully. He protects us all and your mom and dad, and he will protect you too. And nothing bad will never happen to you. Let's go, baby, or we'll be late. The sacrament of baptism plunged Nancy into a state of calm and peace. A bishop with kind eyes and a beautiful vestment stroked her head and called her God's Nancy. The girl felt something special in those words. A small cross on a string appeared around the girl's neck. But what Nancy liked best of all was her father's gift. In the evening he called his daughter and showed her the metal circles, silk, on which was depicted a beautiful woman with a baby in her arms. This is the Virgin Mary, said the father of the protector, the intercessor of all children and women. Now look at what's inside. Chuck unfolded the locket and pointed at. Inside was enclosed a small picture of her mom, just like the one that hung on the wall in their house, only it was tiny. It's mommy, the girl said in fascination. Yes, dear, answered the father and put the locket around Nancy's neck. Take care of her and may she always be near. The girl nodded, looking into her father's eyes, and he stroked her head and hugged her tightly. Nancy's childhood was a happy one. The first time her father took her to school in the first grade, the girl in her beautiful school uniform walked with one hand, holding her hand and in the other clutching a bouquet of Sharpies grown in a backyard near the house. She was glad that now, like Nick, she would be sitting at a desk and walking to school with a beautiful backpack behind her back. She'd also be making a lot of new friends. The school was in a neighboring village. Every morning a bus took the children from the village. And after lessons it took them back. Chuck worked as a mechanic and could not take my daughter to school by himself. Worried about it. He even asked his mother to meet and see his granddaughter off the bus. The grandmother lived just in the village where the Nancy school was. For the first week she met the bus like clockwork every morning, picked Nancy up and took her to class. And at the end of class she met her at the entrance and got on the bus with the other village kids. But then Chuck's mother became ill and went sick. Nick came to the rescue. Don't feel bad, Uncle Chuck, he said with a business-like look to Nancy's father as they walked home from the bus stop together. I'll keep an eye on her. We're in the same school, so I'll see her every break. I'll be fine and I'll bring her home and make sure her feet are dry. Because yesterday, while I was in class, she got in a puddle with the girls. They pulled a kitten out of the water. So I scooped up my shoes full of water. Chuck patted the boy on the shoulder. Well, brother, then I hope so, he said, smiling at the boy. A couple more weeks later, Chuck came home a little early. From the doorstep, he heard children's voices hold the knife steady. Nick said, it doesn't cut that much. I can't do it. Nancy, you can do it. If you practice more often, the boy said instructively, standing in the doorway. The father watched in amazement as his daughter learned to peel potatoes. On the table were neatly arranged books and notebooks. The children didn't even notice when Chuck walked in. So, what are you guys doing? Daddy, daddy. Nick is teaching me how to peel potatoes. Nancy shouted happily, dropping the knife and hugging her father. Hello, Chuck. Nick, just like an adult, he gave his hand to the man. Here's cooking dinner. I did my homework, you know. I've cooked up some crayons, practiced, and drew a picture. The boy with a business-like look showed his father Nancy the work done. Well done. Chuck smiled. You're real hard workers. Do hard workers get candy and candy? Jumping with impatience, shouted Nancy. Father dumped candy on the table. He went to change. He offered Nick to stay for supper, but the boy refused. 
Mother still had to help feed the cattle and fetch water. He said, and saying goodbye, left. At dinner, the father said to Nancy Nick, good boy, good boy. You stick with him, he'll teach you business and won't let you get hurt. All school years, Nancy and Nick were inseparable. Seeing them together in the street, the boys would shout bride and groom, bitterly threatened them with his fist, and Nancy proudly in the back. Fools, she used to say. Once asked, would you not marry us? Nick stopped, looked at the girl and said, marry when you grow up. Nancy laughed the cripple had such a serious face, as if he was really going to take her as his wife. She genuinely loved Nick and trusted him. But they were friends, and that was all. No, you won't, the girl replied. Why didn't Nick realize that? Because we, friends on friends, do not marry. How much do you understand? Nick sighed. In the summer, they often went to the river to fish, burned a fire and baked potatoes. Lightly salted on top of the missing smoke, it seemed incredibly delicious. While Nancy's father was at work, Nick helped around the house. In the winter, they shoveled snow together. In the yard, they stoked the stove and cooked dinner for Chuck. No one in the village was surprised to see them together. All grown up, childhood friends, Nancy turned into a real beauty with the same dark existing hair and huge eyes with long lashes, like her late mother's. And Nick, who was older than the girl, turned into a real man. Broad-shouldered, tall, strong. When he received the summons to the military enlistment office, Nick was a little confused. He knew that soon he would be drafted into the army. He was only worried about how Nancy would be without him. His father was hardly ever home. Chuck worked hard to provide the best for his daughter. The girl's grandparents had died a year ago. Nick's parents duly arranged a send-off for their son. It's a joke. Their son will be serving somewhere far away for two years. We have to give him a proper send-off. They set a big table in the yard, invited neighbors and classmates. The girls helped their mother. The boys carried dishes, pies, and simple treats to the table. Nancy was among them. My father played on the accordion, sitting on the stoop by the fence. And when one of the villagers passed by he called out to see his son off to clap the paper. The walk was in full swing when a panting man ran into the yard. Nancy here, he shouted loudly, taking his cap off his head. Then I heard a girl call out. The man hesitated, and then with difficulty holding his breath, said, Trouble. Nancy, your father is dead. He is. Nancy rose from the table and sat down on the bench again. The guests were silent without sound. Pro mood calmed down. He was electrocuted by the transformer, a short circuit, and all at once, there was a murmur among the guests. The news of Chuck's death silenced the guests. A mournful look of bewilderment and incomprehension appeared on their faces. Nick jumped up to Nancy. She sat unblinking. Her hands were as cold as the water in the river pool. Her face was pale, stony. Nancy called softly to him, come with me. He lifted the girl from the table, took her to the vegetable garden, sat her down on a bench. Nick knew and now it was necessary to cry. The boy held Nancy tightly to him, stroked her head and kissed her forehead cheeks gently, trying not to breathe. She sobbed, shuddering silently and Nick felt his heart bursting with pity for Nancy. They sat hugging each other for a long time. Nancy's head rested on the boy's shoulder, and he held her tightly against him. As if with that embrace, he was ready to protect her from the world, from all evil and trouble, from the worst thing that could happen in her life. Daddy's death. The boy and the girl did not notice his mother lowered down on the bench next to him. Nick, she handed him a glass of water. Let him drink, I put some sedative drops on it. Quietly said the woman. Nick handed the glass to Nancy holding it out to her while she drank. Everyone dispersed, let's go inside. Nancy doesn't need to go back to her place tonight. She can't be left alone, her voice is gone. What's the grief? Nick's mother got up and headed for the house. Nancy had been like a daughter to her for a long time. She even sometimes thought that when she returned from the army, Nick would announce that he was going to marry her. She and her father would be overjoyed. Chuck's daughter's a good girl, and Nick is apparently very fond of her. And Nick and Nancy sat on the bench growing lilacs, 
and at the very dawn the girl climbed the clouds and fell asleep on his shoulder. Nick was afraid to move lest he should disturb her sleep. How will you be without? I thought to himself. A few days later, Nancy's father was buried. Nick's mother Vanessa and her husband organized the funeral and the wake. The table was set in the house. The workers from the tractor shop where Chuck worked came. Neighbors all who respected the man who died. The speech that Chuck was a great worker and a loyal comrade was given by the supervisor. Taking shot glasses in their hands, the attendees honored the deceased with refreshments, and when the women dispersed, they began to help Nancy clear the table. Nancy, you'll have a hard time on your own, Jim's mother said. The one whose house was across the fence and who had been bullying the neighbor girl all his childhood. I'll tell you what, girl we come on like us, going through the whole household, we have a big unite. And when you graduate, Jim will marry you. You'll be a strong family and your father and I will help you. Do you have a vegetable garden? It's so big again, shame on you. Cindy sharply interrupted her Vanessa. The girl lost her father. She's all alone in the world and you're a farm. Why? You should have seen the kindness on the walls. Jim's mother was angry. Yours is in the army. Auntie's catching up with her, only who's looking after the girl now. But get out of here before you call your man. I didn't tell the women all about you. She took a rag on the woman and Vanessa found time to be a crybaby. We'll see, we'll see, said the mother to Jim and left the house. Vanessa put her arm around Nancy's shoulders and listen, no one daughter. Quietly, she said, you'll do just fine. Your late mother was my girlfriend, and she ran the whole household by herself. And she married very young, too. God rest her soul. Nancy spent the whole summer tending to the farm and garden. Vanessa helped her to get a survivor's pension, but it was very small. Winter was coming. We had to buy wood to keep the house. Nancy took her purse out of her bag and counted the money. It was all she had left. Good, at least cucumbers and cabbage are growing in the vegetable garden. The chickens are laying well, the girl thought and headed for the store. On the door of the village store she noticed an advertisement for a cleaner. Hello Lucy. She addressed the sales clerk not black bread and flour. Hello Nancy. How are you? How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. The girl put bread and flour in the bag. She was about to leave, but hesitated. The sales girl asked something else. Lucy, is there an ad on your door? Can I get a job as a cleaner? I'd be good at cleaning, believe me. I don't know. The girl thoughtfully said the woman. You're going to school soon, when will you have time? I'll manage. You just take it. Asked Nancy. All right, come tomorrow morning. I'll show you everything. Thank you very much. I won't let you down. Nancy hurried home. And the next day, before the store opened, she was standing at the door. She had to get up earlier than usual to have time to feed the chickens, take the cow out of the gate and give the piglets food. High on the walls greeted with a wave of the hand and the saleswoman Lucy, seeing Nancy outside the store, waiting already. Well done, come in. The saleswoman gave the girl a bucket, rags, broom, mop and detergents, showing the front of work, reminded that it is necessary not only to clean the floor, but also every day to wipe the windows and counters. In the fall and spring it is still necessary to wash the windows. But that's if you work until fall. Yes, I am. Where am I supposed to go? Nancy assured the woman. Daddy's pension is so small. Just enough to eat. I don't know how to buy firewood. Listen, why don't you start selling eggs and milk? That'll give you some money, Lucy suggested. Who needs it in the village? Nancy laughed. Every yard has its own cattle. It's not that you can't surprise anyone with these goods. Wait, a family came to see me the other day, not on the outskirts. Cottage built for the summer, they come with children, said Lucy. So they asked from whom they can buy natural products. Not only do they need milk and eggs, they also need vegetables and herbs and you have a huge vegetable garden. How can you do it all by yourself? You want me to talk to them. If the Lucys came again, it would be so wonderful. Nancy was glad. No, it wouldn't. Money's really tight. I'll just finish ninth grade and then I'll move to the district center. There I'll study and find a job. And if they come over, I'll talk, Lucy promised. 
And now let's get to work quickly. You'll help everything faster. You'll go home and do your own thing. Nancy grabbed a bucket and went to draw the water of her soul. There was hope that she wouldn't have to drop out of school. She was already seriously considering it because there were no funds, no strength, and no support. It was true that Nick wrote letters almost every week. Nancy was delighted when she received them. There was so much warmth in each line, something close and dear to her. In the evenings, she wrote him answers, but the letters were short. Nothing new was happening in the girl's life. Lucy kept her promise. A city family, settled outside the village in a cottage village, began to come to Nancy every other day. They bought eggs, steamed milk, vegetables, and herbs from the girl. They paid money without asking the price. They gave more than Nancy, dared to ask and never took change. The girl didn't know how to thank the saleswoman. Nancy's buyers also told their neighbors in the cottage community about the girl. And after a couple of weeks, other vacationers at the cottages reached out to her house. Now Nancy could save money for the future, buy fodder for the cattle for the winter, bring firewood, when the tall fell out of the tractor trailer into the yard and formed a whole mountain. The girl looked at this wealth in contemplation. Who was going to chop them? She looked at the axe, took it in her hands and tried to knock the bales. The point of the axe in, singed into the wood and did not want to cling to it. All this was seen from the fence by Jim Cindy's mother. Are you going to chop Nancy for firewood? She shouted. Hello, Aunt Cindy. I couldn't chop a pile of wood like that. And the axe is so heavy. Where have you seen women chopping wood? Laughing, the neighbor asked. I just called Jim. He'll take care of your evidence in no time. Nancy wanted to refuse. She didn't want to let nasty Jim into the yard. But the woman was already behind the fence. A few minutes later, Jim showed up at the gate. Mother said you should chop wood. Thank you, Vasia. Please help me, I'll pay, because I can't pay you myself. All right, Jim smiled wryly. He took an ax and started chopping wood. Nancy watched until the logs were stacked in a separate pile. The girl threw on a sweater and began to whisk them away in a broom, stacking them neatly on the ladder. Jim sweated in the heat, threw off his shirt and tossed it on Nancy's bench. Get some water. Hot loudly asked the boy. I'll get it right away. The girl headed into the house. She leaned over the water tank as she suddenly felt someone grab her. Nancy jerked, but Jim held her against the wall. Don't you flinch. I'm not going to hurt you. Jim gave her tobacco-scented breath and reached up to kiss her. But Nancy pulled away and grabbed the knife. Get out of here or I won't be responsible for me. She held the point out in front of the guy. What crazy people. Jim spat on the floor and tried for the exit. You're all alone. I meant well. Breathing heavily, Nancy sat down on a stool, tears suddenly streaming from her eyes. She hadn't cried once since the day she'd seen the crust off, not even at her father's funeral. Standing at the grave, I couldn't drop tears, but now she cried as if she were a child. As if she was in great pain, as if her whole heart was being torn apart by a pinching pain. And there was no strength to bear that pain. A year later Nancy graduated from a nine-year-old school. The end of May was very warm. The scent of lilacs and cherry blossoms was in the air. The girl stood at the bus station, waiting for the bus to the village. She was returning home from the city. Nancy had spent the whole day in the regional center to find out the conditions of admission to the technical school, to take the list of necessary documents and to pass the medical commission. It was still half an hour before the bus. She went to the nearest store, bought ice cream and juice, sat down on a bench. Han heard Nancy's voice and looked up. A young man stood in front of the girl. A sports bag hung over his shoulder. May I sit down? He asked again. Yes, of course. Nancy moved a little, making room. People with bags and suitcases were rushing around, leading children by the hand. It was the beginning of the vacation season, and Nancy had a house full of work to do in the vegetable garden. It was time to plant potatoes and other vegetables, so she dug it up. It's just a few beds. There wasn't enough time or energy. Nancy was already thinking about leaving the village and going to the city to live. She asked people how to sell a house, and they just shook their heads. Who needs a house in the country? 
Now everyone goes on vacation in the South in foreign countries. And it was a pity to part with the house where her parents lived, where her childhood passed. Did something happen to you? Asked the man suddenly. No. Why would you say that? I thought you looked sad. I was just thinking. A young man with a pleasant appearance looked at Nancy carefully. He had a nice face. His bee was falling slightly on his high forehead, and he kept correcting it. I see. My name is Kevin. Don't worry about you, I'm not trying to hit on you. I'm just trying to pass the time on the bus. I'm tired of being alone. Waiting around? I don't think so. I Nancy answered the girl. Let me guess. You're a student going home for the vacations. No, you're not. I'm just about to start college. Where are you going? The man asked again. To the furnace. I live there. Good luck. We're on our way. Kevin was happy. Are you visiting? It's just that I've never seen you in our village. Nancy looked at his face. It was completely unfamiliar. No, I want to change everything in my life and become a villager. I'm sick of the city, the noise. I want to farm the land, live, work. It's strange. People are leaving the countryside now, and you're going to the village. They've announced the boarding of an intercity bus. Is that ours? Nancy said and got up from the bench. On the bus, Kevin took the seat next to the girl. All the way he was telling her something, making her laugh. And after half an hour it seemed to her that she had known this interesting guy for a long time. Nancy, do you know who in the village can rent a house or at least a room? He asked, and Nancy noticed that Kevin easily switched to you in the conversation. I don't know, the girl replied. Don't we have a place to live? Yes. It just so happened that I didn't worry about leaving everything behind in the city. We're settled in a new place. Maybe you can tell me who I can turn to in cooking. I do not know exactly who to turn to. But if you're in a desperate situation, I can let you stay with me for a while. It's true, Kevin. Don't worry, I won't hurt you and I'll pay you well. Money is not superfluous. I'm not afraid, said Nancy with a smile. Soon our stop will be here. Nancy really needed the money. She also thought it would be more fun to live in the house with Kevin. At least she'd have someone to talk to. And here you're all alone all day. Nancy said, letting the guest into the house. She took him to her father's room, which had not changed in a year. You'll be comfortable here. I'll put the kettle on and bring some clean linen. Kevin looked around at the house. It was clean and spacious. No signs of wealth but you can see that the girl tried to create coziness. The girl left the cups on the table, put out cookies and candies on a plate. Now we'll have tea for a snack. And then I'll cook, she said to Kevin. Will you sit down? Nancy, let's use the first name. Since we're going to live under the same roof now, the boy suggested it. I don't mind. The girl shrugged. Good for you, Kevin sipped the flavored tea, took the cookie. You live alone? Yes. My father died a year ago, and my mom is long gone. I'm sorry, it's okay, I'm getting used to it. It was hard at first. My dad was running the household, and it was hard for me to do it alone. Now everything seems to be fine. I have to go to technical school and go to the city. Will you have to sell the cow for the vegetable garden alive or not? Still, I think so. It's hard to do it alone, nodded Kevin. Will you show me the farm? Of course I will, laughed the girl. What's there to see? It's just like everyone else's. I'm interested. That same day, Kevin started to dig the vegetable garden. Looking out the window, how did he use the shovel? Nancy smiled without noticing. How a man misses the earth. It's obvious he enjoys working. She thought. In the evening, the girl heated the sauna and cooked dinner. She caught herself thinking that she did not feel any awkwardness or discomfort from the fact that a man had appeared in the house as if he had lived here all the time and then left and came back again. She even thought about selling the house to him, but it was a little scary to be homeless. So Nancy decided to let him live here, and she would come for vacations. At dinner she told Kevin about her idea, and he was happy to hear about it, assuring her that the house, vegetable garden, and livestock would be fine. Two weeks later Nancy applied for technical school, and two more weeks later she found out she was out, she returned home very upset, and barely entering her room, cried with resentment. But why is she so unlucky? 
Her life is already difficult, but she can't even make her plans come true. Seeing her tears, Kevin sat down beside her. Why are you so upset? Will you get in next year? He said, trying to calm her down. Is that the point of life? Does everyone have to study at a technical school and live in the city? What is the meaning of life for you wiping away tears? Nancy asked. In living well, working hard, being proud of your home, your household, your family. I don't have a family, Nancy said quietly. And there's nothing to be proud of. Kevin was silent for a minute and then said, you know what? Let me help you. You and I will start such a farm that everybody will have one. We will sell meat, milk, eggs, and invest the money in the house or go on vacation. There are so many places in the world that you want to see with your own eyes. Nancy had no other choice. She nodded, not really sure what would change in her life. Essentially, everything would remain the same. Summer with its vegetable gardens and chores, and the long winter with its snowy noses. Nancy and Kevin became friends very quickly. The girl liked cheerful and never dull. And Kevin, who in addition turned out to be also very hands-on and enterprising person. Already in a month the Nancy farmstead got a fresher look. The barn had a new roof, and in the barn Kevin replaced the door, which was almost completely warped and falling apart, and built new feeders for the pets. He helped Nancy in the vegetable garden, and he did everything as if he had lived in the village all his life. So Nancy found a fiancé. Neighbor Cindy told the village women, He's a good lad. I guess he'll be lucky with a girl. The men talked. Nancy only waved them off when they heard such talk. He's not my fiancé at all, but she noticed more and more often that she liked Kevin. He knew a lot of interesting things, told Nancy about different cities where he had once been, and they were also united by their difficult childhood. Like Nancy, Kevin's mother had died. He was just a baby then and he didn't even remember her face. My grandmother told me that my mother was beautiful. One day some hooligans picked on her in the street. She fought back, tried to run away. They sent her to the afterlife. Kevin Nancy told me sadly. She listened silently, not noticing a tear rolling down her cheek. Pity for the boy, who had been left without a mother's care because of the fault of some scoundrels, tore her heart. For Nancy's birthday, Kevin made a feast. In the morning looked out into the yard, she saw a lot of balloons, hung them on the fence trees, bushes. In the middle of the yard was a table, and on it a three-litter jar with a bouquet of flowers. The girl went out, and Kevin, noticing her, made an upset look. I didn't have time to prepare everything, he said. What's this? Nancy asked in surprise. Are the hair in a braid? You, I'm sorry, I saw on the dresser your papers that you collected for admission there. Anyway, I found out it was your birthday, so I thought I'd say happy birthday and throw you a party. Thank you. No one's ever thrown a birthday party like this. Thanked Nancy. You like it? I bought a cake too. Really? Where'd you get it? The girl knew they didn't bring cakes to the village store. People here like pies and bake them at home. Yesterday I went to the neighboring village and hid it in the barn, Kevin answered. Nancy laughed. She was so happy and pleased that someone had taken care of her earlier. The very first person to wish her a happy birthday was her dad. And then Nick. Well are we standing then? I'll go and put the kettle on, you go and get your treasure out of the shed. We'll have tea and cake. Nancy, laughing, ran into the house. She was in a wonderful happy mood. Over tea, they chatted merrily about all sorts of things. And then Kevin suggested, let's have a kebab fry in the evening. Nancy was surprised. Yes, we'll build a fire and cook the meat. Only it should be marinated first. About soaking it well so it's juicy. I agree, but do it yourself, because I don't know how. The girl supported the idea. While she was busy with the shelf and beds, Kevin built an improvised brazier from bricks found in the yard. Built a fire. Nearby in a pot stood flavorful meats with various herbs and spices. Nancy with a full bucket of cucumbers and tomatoes stood in front of Kevin and could not hide her surprise. How he could do everything so quickly. In the evening they had a real feast. On the table, there was a bowl of salad, roasted meat, tasting the smoke of the fire. Kevin even bought a bottle of wine from the village store, for the occasion of a birthday can, so Nancy shrugged her shoulders. 
She'd never tasted wine. Her father didn't drink and there was no booze in the house. But Kevin poured two glasses anyway, said a toast to you, Nancy, good people are few and far between. You weren't very lucky that I met you at the bus station to wish you a happy birthday. He drank from the glass. She looked at the red liquid uncertainly. If you don't want to, don't drink it, Kevin smiled. You can just kill symbolically for the celebration. She knocked back the wine. It was very sweet, delicious. Bear with it for a little while. And I want to say thank you too. The girl said, no one was bored with you every day something happens. I, for example, have never tasted such delicious meat. What's that? I'll tell you without false modesty. I have many talents. I'm sure you do. Nancy interrupted him. And I really want to dance. Let's put on some music. Birthday girl's wishes. Kevin Law went to the house to get an old tape recorder. That night they had fun, they danced, and Nancy felt happy, like she was back in her childhood. She wasn't scared. She wasn't alone in the house. The wine hit her head. Nancy kept laughing and spinning around the yard. She didn't notice the quiet music playing and Kevin putting his arm around her waist and pulling her close to him. Shall we dance? He asked, looking into her eyes. Come on. His hands were very strong. Nancy put her hands on his shoulders, felt Kevin's heart beating, and he gently kissed her cheek. Without knowing why Nancy felt a rush of warmth in her chest, it felt good. That touch. Kevin had whispered words to her this night that the girl had never heard from anyone else. Most tender, sensual, he'd said. She wished those moments of burning sensation of joy would never end. Waking up in the morning, she didn't find Kevin beside her Nancy stretched under the covers, then resolutely got up, looked out the window. In the yard, Kevin was dousing everything from a bucket of cold water. Kevin waved her hand at him. Let's go to breakfast. I'm coming. The girl put the kettle on the stove, took cheese and sausage out of the refrigerator, made sandwiches. Kevin hugged her, kissed her, and caught a slightly confused look. Let's start a new life with this breakfast, he said. I want you to be my wife. Nancy was taken aback at such words. She remained silent, looking into his eyes. You agree? Kevin ran his hand through her hair, and Nancy felt like a little girl again. I do. A smile appeared on her face. A month later, Kevin and Nancy quietly signed the marriage at the village registry office. The head of the administration gave them a document, according to which they became husband and wife. In the fall, Nancy realized she was pregnant. We're going to have a baby, she said. One night at dinner, Kevin. That's wonderful news. Her husband seemed pleased, but noticing Nancy's confusion, he realized that she herself was not very happy about the news. Why don't you want a child? You seem a little sad to me. I don't know. I wanted to go back to technical school. Kevin got up from the table, went to the window. He was quiet for a moment. And then he said to Nancy, studying isn't the main goal in life. What will a diploma from the technical school give you? Golden Mountains, a new, spacious, beautiful house. A car you can drive to the city whenever you want, not to fit the bus schedule. He's not gonna give you all that. What about living without an education, Kevin? Nancy asked quietly. It's fine, it's fine, her husband replied, raising his voice. Building the house, raising children, expanding the farm, minding your own business. Look at that. You and I have everything for this. The land, hands, head, people around us who also want to live well. Nancy was silent, her eyes downcast. She was afraid that Kevin was leading up to the point where she should abort. To get rid of the baby. His words she took it that way until there was a big beautiful house, a car and a huge household. It was too early to have children. The girl was sad. You know how you and I could turn this thing around. While all your high school friends are away at school, they'll be back. And you're a big farm owner with a bunch of contracts for your mini factory. And the baby? Nancy interrupted him. What doesn't the baby understand? Husband, the baby's growing up. Pleases mom and dad, who in turn, pleases him with new toys. And then a computer trips. He's happy with anything because they love him and care about him. That's not how I envision a normal family. Kevin and I'm pregnant, and we're having a baby. 
Pronouncing every word clearly, Nancy said, not sometime in the future, but in a few months. So that's great. It'll just make us try to do everything we can to be ready for the baby. So you're okay with the baby, not angry that I'm pregnant. Kevin splayed her hands, took his head, exhaled loudly, and then hugged his wife and mouthed how silly you are. How can I be angry if you have my blood in your belly? Minuchka, my baby, my son or daughter. Nancy felt as if a stone had fallen from her soul. She hugged Kevin too, pressed herself against him. The couple began to prepare for the birth of their firstborn. Kevin decided that over the winter he had to renovate the house. That's why he invested all the money from the sale of vegetables, meat, and milk in building materials. The house is not big enough for the family, he said. In the spring, we'll have to expand. I think to make additions, and there to place not only a nursery, but also a bathroom, so that everything would be landscaped. I'm tired of running to the bathroom outside. How is it all? Just one. I'll hire workers. In the meantime, we'll save up the money. Kevin was determined. And Nancy was glad that the boy was a hard worker, didn't drink, and didn't go out. The winter flew by surprisingly quickly. The future mother spent her evenings knitting and sewing the dowry of her firstborn. He was due in May. And Nancy was very much looking forward to it, and at the same time a little afraid of childbirth. On a warm May afternoon she went out of the gate, brought out the cow and calf, which were to be led to the pasture by the village shepherd. The weather was fine, with no windy sunshine to lose, and the clear emerald-colored foliage appeared on the trees. Nancy put her face to the sunbeam and closed her eyes. How nice it is that the baby will be born in the warm season so that we can walk with him outside. She thought, when she opened her eyes, she saw a passerby approaching in the distance. He was wearing a military uniform. The young man was walking towards her house. The closer he got, the more dizzy Nancy became. It was Nick. The guy looked grown up mature. The military uniform looked good on him. It fit like it was tailored to his neck, meticulously tailored. Nick stopped two meters away from Nancy. He stared at her and couldn't say a word. The young man's gaze was frozen with surprise, incomprehension, and bitterness. Nick could not tear his gaze away from his belly of the girl he had dreamed of meeting for two years. And she was standing in front of him pregnant, incredibly more beautiful. Yeah, more desirable. Hello, Nick, mumbled Nancy and took a few steps towards her childhood friend. You're back for good. Yes, I am. It's been two years. You didn't look like you were expecting me very much. How could I not? I used to write you letters, but there haven't been many lately. I can see that now. You didn't have time to send word. You had better things to do. What are you talking about? Nancy lowered her eyes. I got married. I'm about to become a mom. Congratulations. There was so much pain, disappointment, resentment in his eyes that the girl felt uncomfortable. For two years in the army, Nick thought and thought about how he would return to the village and propose to Nancy. He loved her more than life and realized it even more at a distance. At night, he would toss and turn from the soldier's bed. He saw her image, mentally pressed her to him, stroked her dark, loose hair, gazed into her eyes. Thoughts of his youth sustained him in his most difficult moments. Nick's biggest dream was to return home soon. What was it like now to look at the girl he loved pregnant by another man? Nick, son, came Vanessa's voice. The mother stepped outside the fence and saw her son. You're back, honey. The woman ran up to Nick and Nancy, hugged her son, pulled him close, kissing his cheeks and barely reaching his face. Let's go home. What a joy we are. Neighbors were already starting to look out of the windows of the nearest houses. Nick and Nancy couldn't take their eyes off each other. The mother dragged her son to the gate, but he was like a substitute. Come on, let's go. Nick tugged at him. Go mother and follow. Nick pushed away from himself Vanessa. In a minute I'll be there. The woman stepped aside a little, but she was in no hurry to go home. She was waiting for this moment and afraid at the same time. Vanessa did not write to Nick about Nancy's marriage and pregnancy. She knew the news would break his heart, so she decided to let him serve in peace. No need to go, Nick told Nancy. Glad you're doing well. The boy quickly caught up 
hugged his mother, and together with her disappeared behind the fence of the native house. She slowly wandered into the yard, not knowing herself why she was so excited that she couldn't calm down. Her temples were tearing blood. Her lower back healed sharply, as if she had been working in the vegetable garden all day. Suddenly the girl felt a sharp pain in her stomach. She stopped, grabbing the trunk of a tree with her hand. Mookie bent down and whispered quietly to Peter. Powers peeked out of the barn where by the board. Seeing his wife passed away in pain, he ran up to her. What? What happened? Kevin asked excitedly. I think it started. Oh, it hurts so bad. Nancy felt something warm running down her legs. Her water broke. Quietly squat down, breathed deeply. The man put her on the bench. How can you do that? It's still two weeks away. God, Kevin. Nancy whispered in pain. So sit down for a minute. I quickly told Kevin and ran to the neighbor's house. I flew into the neighbor's yard. He yelled, Vanessa, hurry. Where is your husband? In the field? Is the planting season coming up? Said the woman. What's wrong? Why do you need him? Nancy's in labor at the hospital. We have to take her. Shit, all the men are probably in the field. It'll take the ambulance a while to get here. What do we do? Go to her. I'll be right there. Only now excited Kevin saw next to the neighbor tall guy in an army uniform were the keys to the car mother. The woman ran into the house, brought the keys to the old car. Nick got behind the wheel, shouted open the gate. Pulled up to Nancy's gate, he and opened the back door. Helped Kevin to sit his wife down. Hurry up, Kevin asked excitedly. How can I? Don't worry. Just don't let it get any worse on a road like this. The car sped at breakneck speed toward the exit of the village. At the hospital, Nancy was quickly laid on a gurney and wheeled down the hall. Kevin and Nick remained in the emergency room. Alone calming down a bit, Nancy's husband held out his hand to the strange guy. Thank you, me, Kevin. So your roommate now, he said. Nick looked at the outstretched hand, then at Kevin. He didn't give his hand for anything. He sat down in the chair. What's your name then? Kevin lowered his hand. Nick. Thanks, Nick. It's about time you came back. Where would I be looking for a car in the village now? Out of the door came the nurse who had been the first to run out when Nancy was brought to the hospital. Oh, and Stray, you guys, she said with a shake of her head. Barely made it. A little more time and she'd be in labor in your car. Is she okay? Kevin ran up to her. Who knows? They took her straight to the delivery room. She's hanging in there. She's doing great. She's not even screaming. You can hear such screams here sometimes. The nurse grinned. Would you hear how your wives curse you for the pain of suffering in childbirth? They threaten to throw you out of the house and kill you. Even when the baby is born, there's no limit to the happiness. That's what we are, women. It's been about three hours. All that time Kevin and Nick sat in silence. Each was thinking about something else. Finally, the door shouted and the same nurse appeared in the doorway. She gave birth. And you're nine. She said, rejoiced, dads. It's a boy, a healthy boy. The son breathed a sigh of relief, Kevin. His face broke into a beatific smile. Nick, man, you heard I had a son, Kevin. He wanted to hug Nick. He was so overcome with emotion. But he pulled him away and just said congratulations. You guys go home, the nurse said. There's nothing to do here now. And tomorrow you'll bring your mother's things. It's obvious you didn't pack anything in a hurry. Go on, go on. Nick went to the car and Kevin followed him. On the road, the young father was talking nonstop, probably because of the stress. That's how I waited for him. How worried that the first son was born and not a girl. A man needs a son to help him. And girls, why are all the moms holding on to their skirts? What good are they? That's right, Nick. Nick shrugged uncertainly, but Kevin didn't even notice it. Sons for me. Oh, what's the need for business? I'm planning on building my own. And I can't do it without help. Nancy and I aren't having five more. Why? She's young, I'm strong. And that's the thing we do well in bed. Nick hit the brakes sharply. His passenger nearly hit his head on the windshield. Are you crazy or what? exclaimed Pashka. You have to be careful, you could get killed. Sorry, Nick said quietly through gritted teeth. I was thinking. 
Back in the village, Nick stopped at his house. His mother was waiting for him at the gate. She was worried and ran out to meet him like Nancy. We got there in time. My son's son was born. Vanessa, Kevin shared his joy. Thank you, Nick, for the ride. The doctor said I would have been on the road a little bit longer. Well, thank God. Let's go home. Nick, you're hungry from the road. And tired. No, no, Vanessa. Kevin interrupted her. Nick, and I need to have a little celebration. After all, it's my firstborn. You're like Nick, with a little from the newborn, so to speak, about my feet, my son. Nick was and wanted to back out. But Vanessa wouldn't let him say a word. I will give you a drink on an empty stomach. Come into the courtyard, I'll set the table there and wash my feet, or it's true. A new man has been born. Let's go. In the courtyard, under a canopy from the sun, the boys settled down at the table. And Vanessa put before them boiled potatoes, lard, herbs, and broth, and meat snacks, and no luck yet, she said. The woman sat down next to her. She couldn't look at her son. He had matured in two years, but that was not what the mother noted as she watched Nick knock back a shot glass. There was something about the look in his eyes that made her uneasy. It was longing, or disappointment, or pain. Kevin poured another round. Come on, Nick to your son, we'll drink to his health, he said. You know, I couldn't think of a name for him. Now I do. I'm gonna name him Nick after you. How about that, Nick? Nick almost choked when he heard about his neighbor's decision. Kevin didn't even notice his reaction. He kept pouring and pouring into the shot glasses. He went home quite drunk, swaying on his way home. After returning from the hospital, Nancy plunged headlong into motherhood. She couldn't get enough of her son. She felt the happiest in the world. Kevin was busy expanding the house. He had already made the foundation for an annex, which was planned to be larger than the old house. In the annex, the man planned to place a living room for his son's nursery, a bathroom with a warm toilet. A well had already been built on the plot, through which water would be supplied to the house. There would be no need to carry buckets from the column. He endlessly traveled to the district center, bought materials. One day he came back with a new idea. Nancy, we must expand the farm, he said to his wife at dinner. What for? Don't we have enough? We still have enough, but we don't have anything saved, and we need to save without saving now. Tell me, do you want to take your son to the sea and show him the world? And we need our own car to go to the city. When the time comes, I'll give my son an education. That's right. But how are you going to expand? Asked Nancy, pouring tea for her husband. Tomorrow I'll go to the village administration. I'll talk about the land lease. I think I'll build a farm. It's not an easy business, sighed Nancy. Money doesn't come easy, Kevin replied, raising his index finger in the air. Remember that, and I'll make it work. Just make sure I have lots of babies. No, not anytime soon. Nancy shook his head. That's not the kind of teaching I'll remember for a long time. And Nick is demanding attention. So wait with the hairs for now. She rose from the table and began to clear the dishes. She and her husband lived peacefully and well. Kevin put all his irrepressible energy into his work. The only thing that bothered Nancy was that he didn't want to reckon with the neighbors. This spring, Kevin bought a motorized plow so he wouldn't have to dig the garden with a shovel. And when neighbors asked to use it, he told them to save up money and then buy a car like that for themselves. He refused to help and once Nancy asked him to buy a potted flower. She invited him to a store in the district center. She liked the plants very much. But Kevin refused, said that if you spend money on such nonsense, you won't have any money left for the things you need. There was an unpleasant situation with two hired laborers who helped my husband to build a log cabin for the annex. Kevin promised to pay them. When the work was done, he took a calculator out on the porch and counted how much food they had eaten. Before cigarettes, did you smoke? He took that money out of his paycheck and paid less than half. Rumors of greed on the true man spread throughout the village. Nancy heard people whispering behind her back more than once, but she tried to ignore it. What did she care? She was glowing with happiness. Motherhood was all about the baby, and her eyes were sad only at the sight of Nick. He did not greet her at all at the end of the street, 
and turned around and went in another direction. Nick avoided contact with Nancy in every way possible. But then one day, they unexpectedly ran into each other outside a store. Do you like him? Nick asked. Of course, Nancy smiled, fixing the cap on her son's head. How could one not love such a miracle? And they're about the sun, said the boy dryly. Do you love your husband? Nancy hesitated. The question of her childhood friend had taken her by surprise. She had never thought about it. She was fine, calm with Peter. He was a man who didn't drink, worked hard, did everything for home and family. We're a Nick family. I see that you don't love Nick, and suddenly you take her hand and he doesn't love you. He doesn't love anybody, he only thinks about money. Don't Nick? The girl tried to interrupt him. Get away from him. Nancy? Nick asked. I can't live without you. I'll love your son as my own. Never in anything. Stop it. Nancy pulled his hand away. Her cheeks burned like flames. I have to go. She walked briskly down the street, pulling Nick in front of her. Nick looked at her sadly. When he got home, he took out a gym bag from the closet, threw things in it. Mother, where is the passport? He shouted at the dresser. In the drawer replied Vanessa, entering her son's room. Where are you going? I'm going to the district center. I have an army friend in the police there. He said they'd tear me off there with hands and feet. And there's nothing more for me to do here. It's been 10 years. Kevin was on his way to his dream. He managed to lease a large plot of land behind the village, on which he began to build a farm. And to the surprise of the residents of cooking everything he got where it needed to be. He could bargain and buy material at a favorable price. To whom it is necessary to give on the paw, so that not much nagged before the permit. Further with ease Kevin obtained various permits and passed inspections of sanitary services, arranged for inspectors real feasts, satisfied with such a reception inspectors, without looking, signed all the documents. Five years after the start of construction, the company was already bringing in a good income, and Kevin began to build a small shop for processing meat and milk in the workers, and there was no shortage. People came from all over the county to hire him. Kevin paid little, but the labor market in the countryside was not known for its diversity in high wages. So when workers asked him to raise their wages or pay for overtime, he didn't hesitate to send them away. Who doesn't like it? You can fuck off, Kevin said. No place is empty. There will be someone else. Nick went to school, just like his mother used to. He went with the other kids to the neighboring village. Even though Kevin had his own car, he didn't want to drive the boy. Even though Nancy asked him to. And what else? Kevin's response to his wife's request to take his son to school. Let him take the bus like everybody else. And the rain is fine. Reaches the bus stop won't open up. Nancy was busy all day long at home, often going to the farm to supervise the work, milkmaids, and fulfill her husband's tasks on her own. Women often complained to her about the poor working conditions, the lack of a canteen, a place to rest, and Nancy only waved her hands and sighed. All conversations with her husband were useless. What resting place? Kevin was indignant. They come here to work, not to rest. It doesn't rain, the wind doesn't blow. They should thank them for that. But sometimes Kevin did make grand gestures. So, at the celebration of May 1, he arranged a festivity on the square brought from the neighboring village of local amateur artists. He set up tables with treats, and children that day were given free candy and gingerbread. Go out, cook, happy holiday to you all. Kevin and concluded the solemn holiday speech. The people applauded approvingly. They reached the tables. The festivities lasted until late in the evening. There was music and dancing. And on Christmas Day, a successful farmer brought to the village a tall artificial fir tree, decorated with LED lights, and next to it put a slide for children. After such events, the villagers praised Kevin. They said thank you. But everything about working on the farm was met with grumblings of discontent again and again. Finally, Nancy decided to be persistent. Kevin, for the last time, allocate space for the restroom and dining room. These are people, not cattle. They shouldn't be. They're eating out of cans, bringing their own food, sitting in the barn. Okay, promised him to get away with the snow. 
put it there and set up his canteen. At the end of May, the big house grew up next to the farm. The interior and furnishings. Nancy handled it personally. She literally begged her husband for money for furniture, dishes. And when she said she had to take a job, Kevin the cook couldn't stand it and lost his temper. How many times can you do this? You're gonna take all the money? We're a farm, not a sanatorium, to set up sofas for them. Yeah, I'll feed it to you. Kevin, don't you forget where you started? Nancy reminded him. She was determined to make things right for the workers. You came to my house. You found a roof over your head here, and I never denied you anything. I remember. So, with a reproachful look at her husband, something dissatisfied that I dress you with a needle hairdresser and take you to the city so that the villagers envy you. Or do you want to count every money again? Nancy looked sternly at her husband. I'm telling you you need a cook. End of story. I'm going to town next week. I have to buy something. Prepare the money for the cook too. And if you don't agree, I'll stand at the stove and feed the workers myself. What a bastard. Kevin said when his wife left. Nick, put the kettle on. I haven't eaten anything since this morning, Nick asked. The bosses are furious, demanding to bring up all the cases that have anything to do with the raid on the department store. Nick took the kettle. It was empty. I'm going to get some water, he said and left the office. Nick had been in the district police department for 10 years. He had no regrets in the investigation department. His career was going well. He liked solving crimes. At first, of course, had to get into a lot of things. But under Nick, who had been working in the police department for many years, Nick quickly got into the work. He left the village right after he came back from the army. His favorite girl became someone else's wife and even gave birth to a son. And all the two years of service he dreamed every day about how he and Nancy would get married and have a strong family. Unable to live across the fence with his beloved and her husband, Nick made the decision to leave. Favor in the police served his army buddy, who promised to help settle down. At first, the guy lived at his friend's place. After a few months, he got a service housing, a room in a dormitory. Not a separate apartment, of course. But he's the only one. He doesn't eat more. No matter how much his mother called him to visit the village, Nick never went. His mother and father sometimes came, and they brought him meat, jam from berries picked in the forest, various gifts. His father even tried to shove money to his son, saying that in the city there were other things to spend. And where would he and his mother put it? But Nick wouldn't take it. His paycheck was enough. Here, Nick. Nick put a mug of tea in front of his colleague. Why don't we go to the cafeteria? You're hungry, don't Nick? Not taking his eyes off the papers, Nick replied. Thanks for the tea. The major was sorting out the documents, putting the photos in different stacks. Nick lingered with curiosity. Looking at one of them, the face seemed familiar to him. Nick, who is that? He asked, pointing his finger at the black and white photo. It's kind of a dodgy one. Never found him. The major waved his hand. I don't understand what this picture is doing in the folder. The case has been closed for years. Be a friend and throw the bucket away. I don't eat it anymore. What did you do? Nick took the picture and went to the trash can. Fraud, theft, and you couldn't catch him, huh? Yeah, he was sneaky. Traces for metal. So no bloodhound could have picked it up. Nick took his mind off his paperwork, remembering old cases from back in the day. He rented apartments with expensive furnishings, and then he took all the equipment and took off. What was the point? Asked Nick. After all, to rent an apartment you need money. That's the point and the point paid for a month, and took out the equipment at the price of renting an apartment for several years. Oh, and your memory, Nick. Nick said admiringly. It's a long time ago. Do you remember? But I remember Nick. The major took a drink from his mug and lit a cigarette when they began to establish connections and search for those who knew him. It turned out that he forced his mother against her will to sign a sale for an apartment, and he put the woman in a homeless shelter. He brought her to the shelter, saying that he had picked her up on the road. He dressed his mother in rags and handed her over to the state to take care of her. That's the kind of son he is. Why didn't she file a report on him? Asked Nick. She was generally some kind of strange was quiet. 
Silent all the shelter workers told how they woke up, what happened to her. Well, he didn't get the information from her, from the nurses. He questioned the woman. And then he gave up. Why? Because Nick, it's a grouse, pure and simple. And the investigator didn't need him at all. God forbid such a son. Nick took another look at the photo and was about to send it to the trash. Suddenly he changed his mind. He sat down at the table and began to look at the face on the photo. It seemed very familiar to him, as if he had seen this person somewhere before. Suddenly Nick remembered it was Kevin. It was as if he had been doused with cold water. How could Nancy marry a criminal? Nick called out to Nick Major. Why did your colleague go back to studying documents? And didn't even raise his head, that if I know where this man is, I can show you. Come on, Nick. Who cares? The case has been closed for years. No one's gonna reopen it today. You'll never find the victims in those apartments again. Let him think he's lucky. Where can I see this case in the archives? Nick wouldn't stop. I'm sure Nick looked at Nick and plunged back into his work to retrieve what was forgotten in the archives. Nick's case was not difficult. After spending about half an hour in his office, he had fully researched the old history and written out the address of the orphanage. Where else could Kevin's mother live? And even if she wasn't there, maybe one of the employees would remember something. Nick decided that he would go to the orphanage and find out what kind of a dark horse Kevin was. Kevin was looking around the dining room. Nancy had certainly done her best. The long wooden table was set. Beautiful tablecloth clients. On the benches were soft cushions on the walls hung spurs with different plants. The girl looks like a schoolgirl. Arranged plates on the table, laid out spoons forks. What do you think? What do you think, Kevin? Nancy asked, at her husband's place. Waiting for approval, she liked the cozy atmosphere created by his own hands. Don't you think you were giving him a gift? Like what, for instance? Nancy was as calm as a boa constrictor, watching her husband begin to flare his nostrils, for example. For one thing, why do they have to spend money on a tablecloth? Can't they eat without a tablecloth? Where did you get the flowers? I bought them in town for forks. Why did you waste money? You can eat all the food with spoons, not in a restaurant. It's Pavlik. Tablecloths I bought not one, but three at once for the shooting. Flowers create a cozy atmosphere, help to relax and rest. And every normal person eats with forks. You can't eat a cutlet with a spoon. You should not fry cutlets. Pour a bowl of soup, that's enough. Why should they relax? They go to the farm and the workshop to work, not to relax. Stop it, you work with people, not slaves. They're not serfs. Not only do they work for a pittance, but you don't want to create conditions. You're happy to throw money away. Kevin was angry. We're making good money. The production and the farm made a very good profit last month. It's not the Middle Ages, but the age of new technologies, and people want to live and work in human conditions, not in a stable. Not expecting herself, Nancy gave her husband argument after argument and was determined. I want you to get the workers on both shifts. Women have to walk from who knows where at 4 o'clock at 4 o'clock. After the night shift, workers come back in the dark in the cold and the rain. It's not normal, Kevin. What else? Why don't they each get a car with a private driver? You hear me? That's it. While Nancy picked up the paper set aside and walked towards the exit, Ah, don't make me share the business. I can legally take over the firm, and you can keep your shop. I don't want to sink money into something that's not profitable. I have other plans. Kevin shouted after her. Nancy just waved at him without even turning around. Yesterday the women outside the store were discussing her husband's relationship with the secretary. The girl lived in the neighboring village and had taken a job with Kevin in the shop. At work she noted the lateness of the workers, answered the phone, and most of the time she painted her lips and looked at herself in the mirror. They say Pashkut is sleeping with her, said one of the women. Really? With such a beautiful and smart wife, she splashed her hands. The other woman fell silent when she saw Nancy approaching, but she had already caught the gist of the conversation. She had long suspected that Kevin was walking left and right. He might not even come home for the night saying he had a lot to do in town and had to stay the night. Nancy learned to live with it,
but increasingly realized she had to have a mortgage for the future, so she opened a bank account for her son. After saying hello to the villager, Nancy bought bread and headed home. She was tired enough as it was. She also had to prepare dinner. Kevin came back late. Will you have dinner? Nancy asked. She had already cleared the table, checked her son's homework, and started washing the dishes. Hungry as animals, Kevin said and sat down at the table. Nancy set a plate of pasta in front of him, put it down, chomped on it, moved a bowl of cucumber and tomato salad. Nick and a few other students from school are being sent to a camp on the Black Sea, she said. Sat down at the table. Nancy poured tea for her husband. What's that from? Asked Kevin. He showed good results in all the Olympics during the year. That's why they awarded him a trip. Well done, kid. Only half of the trip has to be paid for by his parents. I have until the end of the week to wire $500 for the trip. Kevin put his fork down on the table, sighed. For Christmas, Nancy had made him buy his son an expensive computer. He'd put up the money, of course. Still, he needed it to study. I can't argue with that, but we can do without the trip to the seaside. Let him stay at home, said the husband to his wife. It's a turbulent time, you shouldn't let him go with just anyone. Are you sorry about the money again? Nancy was indignant. Okay, you're sorry for other people. This is your son, in case you've forgotten. I'm supporting you anyway. But when he saw the look in his wife's eyes, he decided it was better not to. I told Nancy to grow up, earn money and let him go to the sea or to a foreign resort. Let's close this subject and go to sleep, said Nancy, getting up from the table. She realized that it was pointless to talk to her husband. The better things went on at the farm and in production. The higher his level of greed grew. Lately it had been off the charts. And how was it that before, when Kevin had first come into her life, she hadn't noticed that he'd kill himself for a penny? Brushing her hair in front of the bedroom mirror, Nancy thought about what she and her husband had in common. They hadn't lived as husband and wife for a long time, no trips together, no family holidays. When she was a very young girl, Kevin had seemed to her judiciously, intensely caring. And what they also had in common was the loss of their mothers. Kevin had been raised without a mom too. Maybe that's why he didn't grow up to be so affectionate. Maybe he just never knew what a mother's love and care was like. A mother's desire to give her child the best of everything. Nick shook in the bus for several hours on the way and hoped very much that it was not in vain that he was going to the orphanage, where Kevin had brought his mother long ago and left her there under the guise of a woman unknown to him. Why had he done that? Nick didn't know, but he really wanted to see the woman. If he was lucky, she would be able to tell Colia a lot about her son. The orphanage director was surprised to learn what Nick had come for. The case seemed to be closed. We haven't been bothered by the police for a long time, the woman said, and Nick assured her with an unofficial visit. I'd just like to see this woman, try to talk to her. It's not forbidden. I can't prevent you. Just remember, lonely people are very vulnerable. Be gentle, of course, Nick promised. Then go into the courtyard. The woman stood up and went to the window. There she is. Look in the blue sweater. Hello, are you Kelly? Nick asked. The woman, picking up the sleepy grass from the flower of dinner neck. My name is Nick. I want to talk to you. Yes, I'm Kelly. The woman scrutinized the young man. What are you interested in? Nick looked around and noticed a bench. Let's sit down, he suggested. They walked to the bench. I'm interested in your son, Kevin. Nick began. He noticed that the woman had a change in her face, staring at one point in front of her and seemed to be resolved from everything that was going on around her. When you hear the name of Nancy's husband, don't worry, he's fine. It's just that he's my neighbor's husband, he's healthy, suddenly asked the woman. Looked into Nick's eyes, he's fine. Tell me, how did you end up here? Did he bring you here? Why did he leave you in this orphanage? Nick, are you trying to hurt him? Was Kevin's mother trying to figure out why this man she didn't know was here? No, I want to open your son's eyes to his wife, because she is my favorite woman, Nick replied, deciding to be honest to the end. Yes, he's the one who brought me here. Only I don't remember much. First, I signed the papers to sell the apartment. 
and then I was here when I realized what had happened. The apartment had a new owner. My son was missing. Then the police were looking for him. You said he was married. Yes. His wife, Nancy, is the best in the world. Very kind and good. You also have a grandson. The news made Kelly's eyes sparkle. She smiled. You say quietly, the woman said, as you'll be able to see him very soon and get to know him yourself. Nick has no grandparents. Your son said you were dead, Nancy Orphan. I think Nick will be very happy to have a grandmother. I'm not a grandmother. I don't have enough money to buy my grandson presents. It doesn't matter. Nick talked to Kevin's mother for a while and said goodbye, promising that he would be back very soon. He decided that next weekend he would go to the village and tell all the news. Kevin's 35th birthday was approaching. Nancy wondered if her husband would celebrate the birthday, or would he again choose to forget about it? But he, to his wife's surprise, offered to throw a family party himself. You know, I've got a better idea, Nancy said. We'll organize a real anniversary with guests, with gifts, invite people from the district administration. What's wrong with that? You're one of the most successful farmers. They'll be happy to come and congratulate you. We'll set up tents in the field near the shop. We'll set up big tables, invite musicians. Let everyone see that you can not only work, but also celebrate. Nancy knew that Kevin's ego could not withstand such flattery and he would agree. And so he did. The whole organization of the holiday, of course, she took upon herself. On the appointed day from the very early morning on the picturesque meadow bustle people. There were about 100 people invited. Nancy watched as the tables were set. Don't forget to put up name tags so that the guests can see who sits where. She prompted the helpers. Kevin showed up in a beautiful new suit and tie. He looked stately. Having examined the set tables, he said to his wife Nancy, why put expensive wine and appetizers on the far end? The laborers will sit there with the milkmaid and the boy. The moonshine will do. Don't trifle, Kevin. Let the people see. You spare nothing for the people. They'll say bad things about you later. The man grimaced, but agreed. Gradually, the distinguished guests arrived. Among them were the partners to whom Kevin supplied cheese, milk, cottage cheese, sour cream, and meat. There were also the heads of the village administration. Everyone seated themselves at the tables, placing large boxes of gifts next to each other. One by one, the guests stood up and made congratulatory speeches. Kevin smiled haughtily. The guests praised him for the fact that from a simple boy who grew up even without a mother, he was able to achieve great success on his own, has his own business and a strong family. Music was played, punctuated by applause. Toasts and cheers were in full swing. When Nancy took the floor, let me say, dear friends, we are very grateful to all of you for your support, for your invaluable labor. Kevin has done well, of course, but without your contribution to the farm and to production, he could not have succeeded. Wouldn't you, darling? She looked at her husband. He tensed, nodded his head. That's why Kevin wants to thank you all for your diligence and loyalty. All farm and shop workers will receive a bonus of one month's wages on Monday. Hurrah, comrades. Nancy raised her wine glass and looked solemnly around the audience. The guests applauded joyfully. Such news was to their liking. Neither rejoiced nor smiled. Only Kevin, rising from the table, all purple with anger, he said calmly, calmly, it's Nancy's joke. Her joke is so funny. Everything stays the same. You and I still have a year's work to do before the prize. The uncomprehending guests looked at each other in surprise. Kevin turned to his wife. You don't take much on yourself to bear evil, he said, not even embarrassed to be heard by the people present. Who are you? You're a woman. It's your job to mop the floors. Or have you forgotten where to mop? All you do is spend money left and right. Do you even know how I got that money? Kevin was so angry. And Nancy stood looking at him with a calm look. Knowing dear, she replied. How did you get the money you started your business with? Unfortunately for you, I'm not the only one who knows. Nick got out of a nearby car. He opened the back door and held out his hand to the older woman. Come on, Kelly, don't be afraid. Meet your dear guests. Nancy said loudly, this is Kelly. 
She's the mom of our successful entrepreneur, Farmer Kevin. Years ago, he fraudulently sold her apartment and her mom to a homeless shelter, taking her papers. And then he committed several crimes, ripping off ordinary people who had worked for years to make a fortune from what this man had snatched from their apartments. Kevin was wanted by the police, but he managed to get away. It was largely because of me that I was the one who led him into my home then and later married him. But I didn't know about my ex-husband. According to him, Kelly was killed by some thugs on the street on her way home alone. Poor Kevin was all alone. As a little boy, he didn't remember his mom or didn't want to. I'm telling it right. Honey, is that how you started your business? Now everybody knows about it. There will be a bonus for good work, believe me. I'm telling you this as the new head of the firm. Kevin was shaking with anger. He was ready to lash out at his wife, silence her forever. And he would have done so if the police officers had not suddenly appeared twisting Kevin's neck. Nick cost a lot of labor to find the victims of a long forgotten case. And they wrote an application to renew the search for the criminal. Justice had been served. 